Arts Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are crucial to our success. And now I'm delighted to welcome today's speakers, especially my colleague, Karen Smith Yoshimura, um, who will kick things off for us and introduce our panelists. So on to you, Karen. Hi, this is Karen Smith Yoshimura and waiting for the presenter. There I am. And there's my picture. I'm going to be I'm still the OCLC Research Senior Program Officer until November 30th, um, and I will be doing the introduction to the report, and I'm also going to um, facilitate some of the discussage discussions today. So first, I'd like to give some background on the OCLC Research Library Partners Metadata Managers Focus Group. Um, the Discussions and responses, um, as well as the discussions were what comprised the basis of the report. Um, we have representatives from 62 research library partners in 11 countries spanning four continents. Um, when they responded to question sets over the six years covered by the report, if you put them all together, it resulted in 777 pages of response compilations, and that served as the basis of 93 hours of discussion. We had discussions that also resulted in new working groups uh, who published the results of their investigations. These are two examples. Um, they're registering researchers and authority files in 2014 and addressing the challenges with organizational identifiers and his name in 2016. All of the discussions and focus group responses were summarized on our Hanging Together blog, 36 of them in this six year period. And I did a meta synthesis of all of them and categorized them into these five sections of the report. Um, the report also included 148 citations, not just to the Hanging Together blog post, but to other OCLC research reports and references the focus group members included in their responses to the question sets. Um, so the sections we're going over today is the transition to linked data and identifiers, describing the inside out and facilitated collections, evolution of metadata as a service, preparing for future staffing requirements and impact, and it will be followed at the end with a Q&A. Um, our discussion panel today features three of the focus group members who served on the planning group and initiated some of the topics covered by the report. So at this point, um, do we have responses to the poll, Marilee? Uh, we do. They're um, they're sort of creeping in, uh, but we could we could take a look at those. Let's see if I'll uh, share my screen. Um, and we'll be using the same um, we'll be using the same uh, uh, URL for a couple of other polls. So you'll want to hold on to that. You can keep that open in a uh, separate um, tab on your browser and uh, the poll will automatically refresh when we go to the next poll. So right now it looks like, um, uh, and I'll leave this, this poll open for uh, just a, a couple, couple more minutes so we can get some more um, input, but it looks like uh, uh, half of the people have skimmed some part, parts of the report and then we have a split between uh, people who are here to hear about this for the first time and people who are familiar with the, um, uh, with the content, so oh, it's a horse race. Uh, we, we can take a look at this at the end um, and see, but that's that's helpful to know that we've got um, a mix of expertise in the audience. I'm going to turn things back over to you, Karen, and uh, we can take a look at this later on if there's interest. Yes, thank you. It's good to know that at least most of you have at least read at least part of the report, and we'll have more. You'll hear about more. In a little while, starting with Melanie Wacker, Metadata Coordinator at Columbia University. 
Um, she is the current chair of the program for cooperative cataloging. She'll be followed by Jennifer Baxmeyer, Assistant University Librarian for Metadata Services at Princeton University. And she happened to be the previous chair of the PCC. And then we'll have John Reamer, head of the Resource Acquisitions and Metadata Services at UCLA. And he, in fact, is a past PCC chair. And this is also indicative that there is quite a bit of cross-fertilization between the OCLC Research Library Partners Metadata Managers Focus Group and the Program for Cooperative Cataloging. So with that, I'm handing it off to Melanie. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everybody. Many focus group discussions centered on the changes taking place in the transition to link data and identifiers. And looking back over all our discussions and when I was reading through the entire report, report, I quickly realized that linked data and stable identifiers really factored prominently into most other topics as well that the group has been discussing. May that be staffing requirements or research data. It has been clear for a while now that managing data based on text strings alone does not scale well. And the practice leaves us in our own library silo unable to exchange data with other communities. This slide on the left shows what we are doing now. Generally largely copy cataloging or loading batch vendor records with a small portion of original cataloging and authority control as we can afford the time. Given the decrease in staffing levels in cataloging units, that means that the majority of agents in our descriptions are completely uncontrolled and often not even disambiguated. Moving into a linked data environment on the right side of the slide will mean that we refocus our efforts on entity descriptions and link management. And it means that we will finally be able to reuse existing data from other communities. Not only could we then reduce the constant duplication of effort that we can no longer afford, it also makes for a much richer user experience. To get there, we need to get more identifiers into our data. Many libraries are investing effort in reconciliation work, meaning reconciling the text strings in their metadata with existing identifiers. But that still leaves a huge number of entities that simply do not have an identifier in our traditional library vocabulary sources. The report makes this very clear by citing the actual numbers. By 2020, the LC PCC authority file covered only 18% of the total names in WorldCat bibliographic record access points. Or in other words, 11 million LC PCC authority records compared to 62 million in WorldCat identities. Also, reconciliation requires time-intensive manual review to match the correct text string with the correct URI for the many instances where the labels were not disambiguated and therefore match the label of another agent. And because of that, one of the shifts underway is from authority control to identity management and to identify a hub, such as Wikidata. And Wikidata currently covers over 90 million data items. But in addition to that, such identifier hubs not only aggregate identifiers pointing to the same entity in other sources, they also offer labels in different languages and writing systems. The example shown here of Maya Angelou and the many, many different forms of her name illustrate that point. The discussion at the Metadata Managers Focus Group brought to light a surprising number of projects and much experimentation using Wikidata and also Wikibase, which is a software that, uh, platform that underlies Wikidata. Some at individual institutions and some on the network level. I just want to point to Karen's hanging together blog post on experimentation with Wikibase and Wikidata that lists many of them. Descriptions of persons affiliated with Stanford University, the Guido Adler Collection Project from Harvard, and a proof of concept combining Library of Congress prints and photograph collection records with Wikidata are only three of the really interesting examples that are worth checking out. With my PCC hat on, 
I would like to point out that in the current PCC strategic direction, this is a focus of strategic direction four. Accelerate the movement towards a big use identifier creation and identifier management at the network level. And work is well underway. The PCC task group on identity management on NACO, whose chair John Lima is also on the panel today, initiated several pilots, such as ISNI, the Horizon Mars, and now the PCC Wikidata pilot. The latter includes both PCC and non-PCC institutions in an effort to broaden participation and inclusiveness. When OCLC Research did a 2017 survey of the Research Library Partnership on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, metadata in library catalogs, which is the third double bar there from the left, lagged behind in changes that institutions had already initiated in their workflows. Um, in their workflows to comply with their equity, diversity, and inclusion goals and principles. As the Wikidata slide earlier illustrated, the ability to link to multiple vocabularies with different labels is a promising approach to address language issues. It also affords us more flexibility in other ways. For instance, the possibility of choosing a label for local, local display that may be preferable in that context or to a particular group. It also opens the door to have non nacle trained staff, for instance, uh, curators, archival staff, faculty members, maybe even um, students, contribute to the different descriptions, thereby allowing us to draw from subject, subject expertise and language knowledge that may not be present or no longer be present uh, in the cataloging unit itself. Persistent identifiers are the backbone of linked data and identifier hubs accommodating multiple labels, scripts, and languages offer promise to solve some very important issues. However, of course, there's a lot more to it. Other issues that need to be addressed include tools, systems that are able to consume linked data, discovery interfaces able to take advantage of the underlying and the external data, um, plus ontologies, training, best practices, and new workflows. It really touches on everything we do. So we have our work cut out for us. And I think uh, now I'm handing it back to Karen. Sorry, I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, the next section focused on specific challenges in describing the materials created and curated by institutions. Um, what Lorcan Dempsey's Inside Out collection um, referred to. And it reflects the firm belief that metadata underlies all discovery regardless of format now and in the future. And now we're going to our second poll because we're interested in finding how many of you are involved in these different five formats that we covered, archival collections, archived websites, audio and video collections, image collections, and research data. Um, because the focus group has a firm belief that metadata underlies all discovery regardless of format now and in the future. The image collections provided an opportunity to highlight the OCLC Research ResearchWorks IIIF Explorer to showcase the wonderful opportunity to retrieve images across different institutions and collections. And now I think I would like to invite our discussion panels to talk about what the, the your perspectives are on handling and describing the Inside Out collection. And I'll start in alphabetical by first name, Jennifer. Uh, yes, thanks, Karen. So um, some of the things we've been talking about at Princeton, um, we've been focusing a little more on digitizing um, some of our collections and enriching the metadata for some of the more important archival collections, such as our Islamic manuscripts. Um, we have a digital project steering group that actually includes a metadata specialist at the very beginning of the process when um, somebody proposes a digital project. So we're, we're right there at the very beginning in terms of 
um, thinking about how the metadata will be designed, vocabularies and that sort of thing. And um, last year, we um, launched a, the um, Princeton Research Data Service. And one of the things I plan to do going forward is looking for ways to involve more of our metadata specialists with Princeton researchers um, to help them um, as they determine the best way to manage and curate their research data, as well as um, make it available to the broader research community. So those are just a few of the things that, that we've been thinking about in terms of our inside collections. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. John. Thanks, Karen. Um, I had just a sentence or so to say about all five of those things. Um, it was noted that there was a difference in practice between archivists preferring fullest form of name and librarians preferring preferred forms of names on publications. So I was wondering, with the shift in, um, from authority work to identity management, this difference in practice could be bridged and different communities could focus on the same thing, creating identifiers for entities that don't have them. That's a great, yes, that's a great example of bridging differences in practices, um, even within an institution. For archived websites, um, I was thinking that these could be viewed as a collective collection and the metadata provision could happen at an institution that did not do the archiving of the original websites based on curatorial and selector interests. There's a possibility of collaboration. Great. Thank you, John. And Melanie. You know, speaking for Columbia University Libraries, um, you know, a few years ago, we launched a new um, set of strategic directions. And one of those directions is to advance knowledge. And out of that, um, we are now um, having a hidden collections initiative, which covers really most of those areas. So for, for instance, our colleagues in the special collections have moved a huge number of finding aids into archive space, which then streamlines the downstream workflows for collection level mark record creation and also then the digital collections work that can out, output some basic metadata for us to start off with. Um, we've had a very robust web archiving program for many years now but also addressing uh, what John just said about collaboration on archive websites. Um, the um, web resource collection librarian for the Ivy Plus libraries is also physically located at Columbia. And that's a program that is aimed at collaborative collection development and description to build curated and thematic collections of um, at-risk web resources. And we are also in the second phase of a huge digitization project focusing on audiovisual materials. I remember I was very glad when we had the discussions at the metadata managers because we were just setting out on this. Uh, but right now we almost have almost 11,000 resources that have been surfaced uh, doing this uh, project. And there, there are a lot more to come. And then um, the talk about the research data. Um, is a relatively new frontier for metadata specialists. And in fact, our discussions within the focus group noted that the library's expertise in metadata standards, identifiers, linked data, and data sharing systems, as well as technical systems, can be invaluable to the research life cycle. So it's good to hear that from some of our discussions that that is starting to happen, at least at some institutions. Um, before we go on, Mary Lee, are, do we have results from the second poll? We sure do, Karen. Um, let me just go ahead and uh, share my screen with you all. And um, you'll see that uh, we've had, and it's not too late to take this poll, um, pollev.com slash OCLCR001. Um, you can see kind of uh, unsurprisingly and uh, in concordance with what uh, our speakers uh, said, archival collections, um, AV collections, uh, right, right up there, followed by image collections, um, archived websites, and research data. A little surprising and different from the webinar that we did a little earlier this week. Um, uh, none of the above is uh, is higher than um, than than I would have expected, but uh, perhaps that means that um, some of the folks on this call have got um, uh, some things to learn and consider if they are going to 
move into that. I'd be interested for those of you who are in that none of the above category, um, uh, if, if this is something you anticipate working on in the future or not. Uh, but I think for now, I'll just turn it back over to Karen and we can maybe take that up in Q&A. Great, thank you. And now um, we're hearing from Jennifer on evolution of metadata as a service. Thank you, Karen, again. Um, before I speak about the evolution of metadata as a service, I'd really like to express my deep gratitude to OCLC's Research Library Partnership for the opportunity to participate in the Metadata Manager's focus group for almost 10 years. Reading the responses from the partner institutions to our question sets over the years and taking part in the truly engaging and thought-provoking discussions related to our shared challenges and opportunities have been invaluable. I'd also like to offer a most heartfelt and sincere thank you to Karen for her leadership. When we talk um, about metadata as a service, we are really looking beyond the traditional uses of metadata that describe library materials and facilitate, facilitate discovery to help develop new services based on the metadata we create. As an example of a new use for meta metadata is um, we have visualizations. On this slide on the left is a map of Australia showing the distribution of indigenous Australian languages represented in the Australian National Bibliographic Database. The visualization is the result of a crowdsourced codathon that brought together libraries and the community. When we think about users of our metadata, we think of publishers perhaps as being a supplier of metadata to us, but the image on the right is a beautiful visual representation of Hachette's top authors represented in the British Library's catalog. It's presented as a giant mur mural that spans eight floors at their UK headquarters. They call it their river of authors, and it was created from a list of over 55,000 authors from the British Library. 5,000 of the most prominent authors are featured on the multi-floor mural. Other examples of innovative uses of metadata that we discussed in the focus group include using metadata to help build library services based on metrics, such as usage data to improve relevancy ranking or personalized search results, or to help with weeding projects. Metadata specialists, those who actually create the metadata can also provide a service to researchers as they embark on research process, projects, as I mentioned earlier. For example, metadata specialists are beginning to work with researchers to provide guidance on metadata standards and how to use controlled vocabularies. Metadata, such as identifiers and bibliographic records, are being used to fetch tables of contents and cover images and even, a, and even generate locator maps based on LC classification. As metadata specialists, we can also offer our expertise as a service to bridge the library domain to other domains, such as working on projects involving the wiki-based platform like OCLC's Project Passage. Over the years, we've discussed many exciting possibilities for metadata specialists to apply their knowledge and the metadata itself to create new services for our library users and the broader community. So you've heard a little bit of what I wanted to contribute to the discussion on this topic, and now I will hand the presentation over to John. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, the implications of the transition on staffing generated lots of discussion on the culture shift necessary plus learning opportunities, the new tools and skills needed, self-education, and addressing staff turnover. It probably has always been a quintessential role for professionals to take on new types of work and activities, to establish best practices, and once adequately trailblazed, to delegate the activities to others and to integrate them into the system. This might have seemed to be an occasional activity focus when a new set of cataloging rules comes along or a new type of material needing to be described emerges. What is different now is that this role of trailblazing, figuring out new strategies and techniques, retooling and reconfiguring and problem solving is turning into a full-time obligation. Why is that so? The metadata world is a multipolar one now. 
There are different partners with similar goals to collaborate with in achieving library aims, and so there are different schemas, identity registries, and standards in play. There is a premium on identifying batch actions that can be taken on metadata in lieu of individual record remediation. The amount of material a library wishes to describe for discovery is ever increasing at a time when it is hard to sustain past staffing levels. And the approach of managing the workload in a manner exclusively within the library domain is just not scalable. The new skills demanded for success by today's metadata professionals will include a focus on overall principles, the ability to learn new tools and techniques quickly, being conversant with information professionals in other settings and cultures, and an ability to identify common interests, and a willingness to collaborate when opportunities arise. The time to modernize the professional positions in a metadata unit is not just when the position becomes vacant and one fervently hopes for administrative approval for reposting. On an incremental annual basis, professional positions should be examined for growth toward these new needs. I'll turn it over back to Karen now. And this is the time that we are asking people to fill in our third and final poll, um, where we're asking you to, of these four sections we just covered, which ones you would like the focus group to um, pursue in more depth. So please take a few minutes, and you're also free to add other things that are not on the list, but of those four sections, where do you would like our future efforts to go in terms of investigation and possible working groups or other types of small projects? So you can upvote or add your own, as you say. So while you're doing that poll, I'm going to quickly go through the report conclusion on impact. Um, and the next generation of metadata will become even more focused on entities rather than record-based descriptions of an institution's collections, as you've heard um, from us a little bit earlier. And the work that's currently underway at OCLC on the shared entity management infrastructure and the focus group's expectation that it will be able to address many of the challenges documented in the report around persistent identifiers, especially providing language-neutral links to trustworthy sources. But I want to focus that the key takeaway uh, for this future of linked data is that good linked data requires good metadata, and that requires all of you to continue to contribute good metadata in whatever platform or system you are using. Um, so, and this is also where we'll have the Q&A, but um, do we have enough uh, polling results yet, Marilee? Yeah, we sure, we can, we can take a look at that. We can also uh, come back later um, and, and take a look. I'll just go ahead and leave this open. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and you guys can see um, some polling in action. Always very excited, exciting. Um, uh, the transition to linked data and identifiers continues to be um, a leading concern, as does preparing for f future staffing requirements. Um, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in metadata, a big focus for us right now. Somebody added that. Um, so just to make things clear, I pre-populated this with the uh, kind of four uh, main things from the um, conclusion of the webinar, but people can uh, definitely, you can add your own. Um, you can uh, you can upvote um, some of those existing things. So uh, there's uh, the the polls as are the poll results as they are right now. Uh, as I said, I'm going to go ahead and leave this open, and um, uh, we can come back and take a look at that at the end if we've got some time. Well, the actual presentation part is completed now, so. Um, we can talk about those poll results also as part of the Q&A. So far, I've seen only one question. Um, is that right? Yes, Karen, I've, uh, I've just entered a, a reminder to folks that now that we've got our Q&A and Karen uh, and our panelists here, uh, please 
um, as you have comments or comments on the report, questions, um, or on what's come through via the polls, please please enter them here. We'd, we'd love to be engaging in a discussion with you. But in the meantime, Karen, we do have that question that's come through, so I thought we could start there. And the question is, a significant issue, and this is from Anna Marie Close, a significant issue I encounter is LCNAF and VIAF identifiers that conflate, com, conflate two individuals as one. Has there been any discussion about these issues as she, she finds it's rather common? Um, I have, in my more recent past, been involved in some of the VIAF developments. Um, and yes, in fact, um, you will come across in VIAF um, a combination, there'll be two different people that are completed, um, and sometimes the other, the opposite also happens. You have two in, uh, different VF identifiers, and they're actually the same person. And, of course, VF is an algorithm, basically. So it's, again, based on good metadata, you know, does if the, if the Library of Congress said this is the same person, and then we take we take that as is, but you, the users and, and researchers and experts can more easily be better tell than any algorithm whether or not two, two different VF identifiers are really should be the same or conversely whether two or more. In some cases, I've seen three different people completed into one. So what do you do about that? The best thing because there's never going to be a perfect algorithm. Um, as much as you hear a lot about machine processing and AI as the new golden bullet, the fact of the matter is people are smarter than any machine or algorithm. So if you come across that in your daily work, there is a place on the VF website, it's sort of in the lower right corner, where you can put in a comment and you put in the identifiers that you see where put in the identifier where you've seen two or more people um, incorrectly identified as one and put that in to that feedback comment and that will go to the internal VF team and there we do have an override mechanism so we can override an algorithm and, and separate them. Thanks Karen, we've had a couple a uh, couple more uh, come in, so uh, let's get to those. So from Iman, the uh, question is, is it possible at this time to engage or collaborate with international GLAM communities um, other than what is available in BIOS to allow linking to their authority files and enrich what we have with more languages and data? Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, this is where I wish we had a panelist who was one of my OCLC colleagues in on dealing with this. But VF really is right now for us, the, um, as far as the OCLC services go, the best way to link to, to have different authority files in different languages. And they're not always just national libraries. We do have some scholarly con contributions, um, such as the Syriac reference portal. Uh, which contributes Syriac, Syriac names, so that's sort of a, not exactly GLAM, but it's not just um, libraries. Um, of course, the Getty Museum and the um, ULAN, the union list of, of uh, artist names, you know, are also part of VF. So, so encouraging more GLAM institutions to contribute to VF would allow more linking to the authority files. And of course, Wikidata and a lot of the sites that Melanie referred to um, are contributing a number of, of a variety of identifiers, not just from the library domain. Um, so Melanie or, or any of the discussants you want to talk or brainstorm a bit about um, more collaboration with international GLAM communities? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I very truly hope that yes, now is the time to start doing that more. Um, and I think once we move more into different interfaces, different displays, for example, 
where you can pull in external data sources, you can link to somebody else. So LAMP communities make their um, files available as linked data. You could link to it. You could maybe create a knowledge pa panel on the site. There are some um, you know, experimental projects that have done that, which is, is very cool. We're not quite there yet on the display side often, but um, I, I very much hope so. Jennifer or John? I liked your idea, Karen, of adding additional identifiers to Wikidata. Slightly going back to the prior question, it seems like um, there are limits to what you can do with algorithms based on text strings alone. If the entity attributes were populated more of the time in more places, then algorithms and AI could use um, those to determine is this the same person or not. True. Yeah, that's been a handicap in the past because some authority files had very basic information, but the more attributes and other characteristics you can enter will help avoid some of that conflation that Anne-Marie mentioned. Um, Jennifer? I actually missed the question because our lights were blinking and I thought we were having a fire drill. <laughs> so I might pass on that. Okay. Uh, well, Jennifer, Jennifer, that is that is a wonderful <laughs> reason to to pass. So, um, and then I just wanted to note uh, that Marilee added in chat. We do enrich VOF with Wikidata, so we get input that way, but um, need to have the authorities in VOF to begin with. And then I want to get through a a bit of an exchange that that um, has come up in chat. So Beth Camden. I started with a question. The focus on batch metadata work is sometimes at odds with the need for good metadata. How do we address? Um, and then maybe I'll, I'll read a few more comments before I open it back up to, to you, Karen, and the panel. Um, and from Jackie, uh, she says, perhaps identify the elements that meet the good metadata criteria and incorporate them into the batch processing routine. Um, and then Larissa adding, that would be mostly checking the presence of certain metadata, but um, not the quality of metadata. We have workflows similar to what you suggested in our rapid cat procedures. Provenance of metadata could be the answer here. Karen, do you want to uh, make some comment on that? Um, I, I'm pleased that Larissa mentioned um, provenance because that really is a becomes a much more important in when you're dealing with not just a community that has all for decades committed to following the same practices, even though those practices or rules change over time. But when you're talking about bridging domains, whether it's archival versus library catalog, digital collections, research data, they're all going to have different practices because they have different needs, a different user community. So, Knowing the provenance of any data becomes even more important. Even within libraries, everybody sort of have their preferred sources. You know, if the Library of Congress says this, if, you know, people will probably say that's more authoritative or the British Library is more authoritative than, say, you know, a local small um, community college or something. Now, community college might be perfectly good for their purposes, but you sort of know who your quote unquote peers are or people. Uh, institutions that are more similar to yours. So there's always been this issue of provenance, and that does come into play um, with, even with Google, you know, and ranking results. They also look at sources, and when they look at sources, that's another way of looking at provenance. Um, but this whole idea of, you know, where, that, where, how do you determine good metadata when so much is being batch processed? I'd like to turn that over to our discussants. Um, and they're allowed to raise their hand, but John is already unmuting. So go ahead, John. Um, well, thinking of the Hippocratic Oath, above all, do no harm. I was thinking you could apply batch techniques in a way where it's safe to do so um, with a recent uh, adding of Cyrillic to old Russian language title records that lacked it that OCLC and UCLA worked on. We looked at what was it possible to do in batch mode and restricted ourselves to just certain fields. And it wouldn't be all the different fields that a human could do working record by record. So um, batch as a tool, depends how you use it, save the individual remediation data element by data element for the things that really uh, there is no other way to do the work. Right. Other comments, input from Melanie or Jennifer? 
Yes, Melanie? So there's definitely the conflict between what we talked about earlier, the unhiding of collections, and we want to get as much as possible unhidden so that people can find it, and the quality of the metadata. You know, the more work you put into it, the fewer resources you can catalog often, even with the help of the very advanced batch processes. But the other issue when I hear good metadata that always comes to my mind is good is often in the eyes of the beholder. I mean, we often get data that was perfectly suitable in the context that it was created. It just doesn't work in our context. But that doesn't necessarily make it bad metadata. Yeah, I would say it's more fit to purpose. And the purpose, the purposes are different, then they'll, they'll have different fits. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> Actually, that's the point I was going to make. We we load thousands upon thousands of e-resource records that we use, you know, uh, batch processes to clean up as best we can, but the records are still pretty bad, but they serve their purpose. So I, I think, like Melanie said, it depends on what what the audience is as to what good means. Yeah, and I think if we go back to this new focus on entities, maybe some of those issues become mitigated because if you're focusing on the entities, then the entities should be the same if you can identify that they're the same entity, even if the other descriptive and other attributes of the record are not fit for, to your purpose. You can pick out in statements rather than records the statements that are usable across domains whether it's a batch-loaded publisher record or or whatever. Um, I'm just looking at where, where are we going on the questions? I want to make sure we have time to address them all. Yes, so I just want to make sure that, let's see, this came through, which is from Emma. The batches are sets of records that libraries are using to enable discoverability of their content often come from external sources such as publishers and suppliers who don't necessarily have the same idea about what constitutes quality metadata for libraries. How can we encourage stakeholders further up the chain to supply us with good metadata? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you don't want to have everybody doing the same batch of uh, mediation using MarkEdit or whatever tools over and over again to make the same set of corrections. So the, the report notes that the British Library has, in fact, been negotiating with some five or so UK publishers to, for example, include ISNIs, you know, in their data. Um, and you, those of you who have university presses, you might be able to have more um, pressure, impact on your own local university presses on how the data would be good, at least for the at least for the information that really represents entities um, rather than the other descriptive data that the other stakeholders need and libraries may not need. Um, other comments from the discussants? Jennifer? I, I, li I think it's a good idea to try to reach out to the suppliers of the metadata, but I haven't found a sustainable way of doing that because it could easily turn into somebody's full-time job, just providing feedback on the records. Maybe that's something that, you know, a group of people, a group of libraries could have some sort of agreement, I'll take this publisher or this vendor, you take that one, and we'll only concentrate on certain ones, thereby uh, improving the pool for everybody. Because otherwise, it's, it's really overwhelming. And Karen, I just wanted to add that um, Andrew McEwen uh, just clarified that at the BL, uh, they have been directly engaging with publishers, um, as, as you noted. Um, and to date, uh, we have supplied 163,400 ISNIs to 16 UK publishers. Um, and these are starting to appear in Onyx metadata for new publications. Right. Okay. Very good. So. The report is already out of date because at the time <laughs> we noted that there were five and now there's 16. So, um, yeah, everything is going to be, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Um, 
And then uh, Emery had, let's see, uh, she had said as a follow-up to her earlier question, thank you for sharing how to notify VIOC about issues with identifiers. However, um, I'll see NAS, FAST, and other authorities often reinforce the same inconsistencies with entities. This might be something for OCLC to research further. We don't want to build our linked data on a house of cards. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and then... I'll just interject here, you know, that we all strive for perfection, but it doesn't really exist. <laughs> you, I, I really doubt that we'll ever have everything 100% correct, especially as, you know, more information becomes available and things that you thought were correct five years ago, it turns out isn't correct when you look at the same data now. Um, so, yes, it is. And it's it's evolving and it's always needs to be improved. But you know we're never going to have a you know perfection. Somebody you know there is this thing that well some metadata is better than no metadata. Well yes and no. I mean if if the some metadata is completely incorrect, then maybe you're better off without it. So it's a balance. It's a catalogers judgment. You know it, it's that's why humans are so important because no algorithm is going to come up with a perfect solution. In my humble opinion, um, sorry. Go ahead. Is there something else I missed? Just to reinforce that, uh, you know, some comments here are coming through chat. But yes, it's a balancing act. Um, if the sum metadata is incredibly poor quality, then it could be argued that it is worse than no um, metadata. But there is that that balancing. Um, and so, and and Beth noted that we also need to think about. Uh, metadata is evolving over time. It's oh. it's never perfect. Uh, and then Anna Marie also um, added this into chat, which is in terms of archival resources, we face a large number of entities that do not exist in current linked data authorities. There are resources like the SNAC project. However, is there a clear understanding regarding how we move forward as a profession with shared entity management for non-published materials that are in archival resources. These are individuals and groups that may have been ignored by authority sources in the past. Um, yes, and that's a that's that's a very good point. Um, the number of names that are represented in archival collections is enormous. Um, so yes, I mean that's I think one of the appeals of Wikidata. Um, to be able to at least start entering um, some of those entities in your collections that are not otherwise represented, although even that will take time. Um, discussants, um, you all have large archives at your institutions. Um, have anything um, that you'd like to contribute to this topic? Just a hope. Oh, okay. Well, Melanie had her hand up, and then John. Yeah, I just want to second the mentioning of Wikidata. You know, it's, for example, as part of the PCC Wikidata pilot, we are right now focusing on oral history collections that are also not also, also not well represented in the authority file. So we're trying to work with those as a um, as a test case. That's good news. We'll be interested to hear that, John. Oh. Uh, basically the same point. I hope Wikidata can be a setting where some of those entities can be registered. And is that something that the PCC task group on um, Wikidata going to address? Melanie? Um, so the Wikidata pilot is uh, managed by the overarching um, task group that is run by John. Okay, so John. <laughs> well, there's 75 um, participants and they've been registering what the projects are gonna work on. I don't have the spreadsheet right in front of me, but that's definitely a possibility if any one of them wanted to participate and do that. So that might be a good way for those of you who are working in archival collections and faced with this enormous number of names, you might want to look into participating in that PCC pilot on Wikidata to see what it you know what it would entail um, to represent those names, and that might be at least um, one way of getting entities with identifiers represented in your collections. 
I think, Marilee, this might be a good time that the discussions look at the results of that third poll. Uh, the poll results actually haven't um, changed all that much. I mean, we can we could take a look at them again just to refresh our memory. Um, I would encourage people to, uh, if you haven't yet um, entered into the poll, um, you can you can do that. That's definitely information that we will be um, uh, uh, sharing with the. Um, Metadata Managers Focus Group as kind of an impetus for uh, future future discussions. So this is your opportunity to to have some influence um, on that. Just as an editorial comment, I am a little surprised to see that um, somebody had added to the poll uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and metadata as a big focus. And I am a little surprised to not see. Um, a little more activity on that, but that was not one of the topics that we seeded the poll with. So, yeah, um, and I'm I'm noting in the chat that Andrew McEwen from the British Library also talks about sustainability as the next big challenge. Looking at CIP workflows to generate an ongoing feedback loop, and this was pioneered by the Bibliothèque Nationale with several French publishers and is a next step for um, the British Library. Um, so what has been sustained is publisher engagement, which is really encouraging in itself. So Jennifer, you mentioned that it's, it could be a full-time job to try to get to the sources of, of the publishers or suppliers. Um, what do you think, it seems like they're better off getting some sustainability in um, the UK and France. What do you what do you think the difference is? I don't know exactly. I wonder just the way we're set up here in the US where we don't really have one national library directing us. So we're not it's like we're each little islands working as best we can and there I mean we have the PCC for in terms of cooperation, but really we're kind of all on our own. I, I don't I don't know really. Yeah, well, since so many of your publications, even within North America, the research libraries do have data coming in from the UK and from France, at least you could benefit from that, those efforts. Um, Marilee, I'm going to ask you to uh, address Jackie Shea's uh, comment on natability being problematic for wiki data items or archival materials. Uh, sure. I was I was actually asking in chat um, if she'd had experience with Wikidata items, although I don't imagine that she would have raised it as an issue if she hadn't been. Um, uh, notability is uh, considerably looser in Wikidata than it is certainly in English language Wikipedia. Um, but there are uh, some uh, loose notability guidelines. Um, there have been you know, numerous projects to pump all sorts of uh, metadata about journal articles into um, Wikidata. And of course, journal literature is quite vast. Um, so uh, I, I would um, have sort of, oh, I see. So Jackie says that she hasn't had experience with that yet, um, but has been aware, aware of the notability issue that we may need to pay attention. Um, I, I would say to not worry about the notability in, in Wikidata uh, so much. Um, I haven't seen um, cases of uh, metadata being, that GLAMs have or uh, the libraries, archives, and museums have contributed being rolled back out of Wikidata. Um, I'm always interested in such cases, so if you know of any or have experienced that yourself, please, please do uh, uh, let us know about that. Um, Beth would love to, to to know more more about that, um, and and this can all come down to the crankiness of one uh, uh, <laughs> one one editor. Um, so 
And Beth also notes that they have a serial project to add ISFMs. Oh, well, that's great. A very, very needed uh, project, um, I think. Uh, and I, I know about that project. Would love to love to um, find out more. Maybe we could ask you to talk about that sometime, Beth. That'd be great. And I'll just note that equity, diversity, and inclusion is often referred to in most of the North American sites as EDI, but I have seen the um, initials transfix. Nobody has used DIE yet that I've seen, D-I-E, but um, there are those that use DEI. But the, the goal, I think, for the community at large is to be more um, inclusive, uh, more equitable, and more diverse. Um, thank, thank you, Karen. I, I think given that we're just about uh, at time, uh, this would be a good time to, to wrap up the Q&A. And I really appreciate the number of folks who have pointed out next challenges, next areas to investigate and explore. So we do invite you to join the Metadata Managers um, focus group um, to continue to explore these with us. Uh, we uh, would appreciate and very much invite your engagement. And at this point, uh, we would love to um, share um, a few words uh, just uh, to, to express our appreciation at Karen. Um, and I think John might have uh, a few things he'd like to say before we wrap up. So, Karen, um, on behalf of Jennifer, Melanie, and all the rest of the planning group for the Metadata Managers Focus Group, I wish to recognize the outstanding job you have done in leading us the past several decades. You always kept us highly organized and on track. You kept us on our toes, calling on participants in discussions who have not said anything yet. I admired how you could draw out of the planning group members the ideas we needed to develop for round-robin question sets and other discussion content for in-person Friday meetings at ALA. In your leading our group in this manner, I was in awe of how many times cutting-edge agenda topics were identified that we needed to know more about or those challenging problem areas we needed to focus more attention on. You steadily grew the scope and influence of our group by extending the in-person meeting content into follow-on virtual sessions that more RLP members could take part in. You deliberately timed those sessions so that those on other continents could realistically participate. You summarized those discussions into hanging together blog posts that could reach even more people. You served as a de facto metadata ambassador in that you were always thoroughly familiar with metadata practices, advances, and projects from around the world, and you could insert that additional perspective into any discussion. During a time when OCLC was consciously striving to grow into a truly international organization, you were personally living that. Please accept our congratulations on a tremendously effective career, and we wish you all the best in the next phase of your life. Thank you, Karen. Applause. Thank you, John, for those lovely words. Thank you, Jennifer and Melanie, for sharing your expertise and insights with us today. And thank you, Karen, for all your years of leadership and service. Um, just thank you so much. To our attendees, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your attendance and participation. We'll post a recording of this webinar online, and I'll notify you by email when that's available. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you all. Have a good day. Before everybody signs off, I just want to uh, thank Jennifer, Melanie. You're still you're still around. John has already left us, but um, thanks thanks so much for your contributions to this. This was really really great, and just a, a pleasure to work with you guys on this. Thank you for organizing. See you next time. Yes, connect with you soon. Take care, all. Thank you. <laughs>